Welcome to Math Wisdom, where every problem is a step towards smarter you. I'm thrilled for today's episode, for today's guest is one of the most popular figures in the field of mathematical Olympiads. This is Ivan Chen, renowned not only for winning a gold medal in the International Mathematical Olympiads, but also as a distinguished coach for the USA national team. He's also a graduate student at MIT. His passions extend into Korean pop dance and puzzle hands, showcasing the diverse interests that fuel his creativity. Today, Ivan will share his wealth of knowledge, offering invaluable insights, strategies, and personal anecdotes to inspire and enhance our mathematical journey. Join us as we dive into a stimulating conversation with Ivan, full of expert advice and engaging stories. Uh, could you delve into your unique experience of participating in the in the Olympiad after midnight till 5 a.m. this morning? <laughs> uh, could you give us a brief uh, overview of yourself and your connection to the world of mathematical <laughs> Olympiads? Uh, yeah, All right. so my name is Evan. I'm a uh... I'm a PhD student at MIT studying number theory, and uh, I was a contestant at the IMO like about nine years ago. And today I'm one of the coaches for the US IMO team and uh, run a training program during the school year of my own, uh, coaching like US students and other students from across the world. Um, You're talking yeah, about right. the uh, OTs, OTs program, yeah, right? OTIS, uh, yeah. OTIS program. <laughs> How did that come into? Um, <laughs> into life uh well at the very first year it started it was like a group of like local high schoolers like a few miles north so, some miles north of me who like were uh wanted to study mo together and were looking for a coach so they somehow found me and i was like sure okay so that was the first year with like you know maybe on the order of, like five-ish students <laughs> and then um people people started talking and then like more people came up to me and then for the next five or six years the number of students i had would double every year <laughs> And it, it's it's stabilized now, so the growth is only linear instead of exponential. So it's it's manageable. Uh, but it, it wasn't any big plan. It just kind of happened, and I wasn't uh, I, I was not ready for it. Honestly, it was just like it kind of happened. Um, it's like it, it shows you. That you <laughs> yeah. <feel> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, and how how does that work? How can one enroll? Is it open to everybody? Um, is it uh, what you what you're putting on YouTube, or is it private coaching uh it, it's a it's a private program um it's uh beca because it's so large now it's um it's almost complete it's completely online at this point because it's from everyone around the world um anyone can apply to it um uh, you just fill out the application um the the structure is uh basically is completely self-study at this point so it's not a thing where i like hold live lectures or anything like this um but there's a there's a system that i've set up where um there's a website that like will give you problems and as you submit more problems, it will unlock new problems to give you. And that's sort of like the core iterates. Um, yeah, you can, if you just search it on the internet, you can find it. There's a syllabus that I have that basically writes everything about how the program works and is probably too long. And I'm trying to trim it down because no one reads the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, um, uh -huh. let's, let's cl clarify this because there is a book called uh, uh -huh. Otis and the program is also called Otis, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the book, our, came out, yeah. Uh -huh. the book came out. The came out back when um, the program was a lot more selective because that was back when I had to. That was back when I would do one-on-one -on -one meetings with every students. So there was like a bound on like how many students I could take every year, uh, which was at that time on the order of like twenty or thirty. So what I did at the time was I took like a lot of the materials that I was using in there and I just posted them for the people like who didn't get into the program, so they had something to do. And that was called the Otis excerpts. It's not a very thick book or anything it's just like a bunch of the problems and discussion handouts that it's like a subset of the handouts and discussion problems that i used in the program um back three or four years ago um so i know yeah. i saw that there are uh, around mm -hmm. 300 students uh enrolled at yeah. the program yes do you teach all of them at the same time or is it divided into groups uh it doesn't it's the, the whole thing is like completely self-based and like uh it runs online now uh so it doesn't it doesn't have traditional lectures or anything like all everything that I would have said, like in a standard lecture format has at this point been written down into text that is uh, given to the students in PDF format. Um, 
I'm generally not an enthusiast of like live lectures. Uh, this is something about my teaching style that I've like discovered over the years, which is that I'm not a particularly good performer. Uh, so it's like, I would rather just like have everything written down in text so that the student can kind of read it at their own pace. And then you have to like, you know, trust that the student is motivated enough to actually go through the things that are written down. But uh, in general, the students I have are like pretty highly motivated. So that has not been too much of an issue. And what's about the uh, Twitch lectures that you put uh, on your YouTube channel? Is that related to the program? Um, not really. I think that's just the separate thing that I did, which was around when the pandemic hit like two or three years ago. Um, the, the short story was that I was kind of bored and I was just like, you know, maybe it would be funny if like uh, we just like streamed math on twitch.tv. <laughs> and apparently uh, that has kept going on since then. Uh, at this point, I stream like about dur like during the school year between like September and April. -ish, uh, I'll put on one of these every week where, um, you know, anyone can hop on and just like throw random math problems at me. And I will uh, I try to solve them with varying amounts of success, depending on how difficult the problem is. Uh, well, you have amassed an impressive collection of Math Olympiad resources online. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, your YouTube channel, your blog, which is mm -hmm. today a reference for IMO contestant. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your contributions have become so influential that nearly every IMO contestant has either utilized or, uh, your materials or mm -hmm. is familiar with your work. Um, what drives you to share and contribute in this manner? Um, I think it's in general just a lot of fun because like I really enjoyed the contest when I was a student and like uh, when I don't know because I I feel like the the students that like work in math Olympiads are like generally like pretty bright and really motivated and it's been like really rewarding just working with them in general. Um, you know they're they have a lot of enthusiasm and that would say they also rubs up on me as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's nice to like be able to help people. <laughs> Um, so you're doing it out of fun. It's, it's not like work. It's not like a show for you. No, no. It's yeah. It, it is a hobby that went slightly too far. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you have achieved the remarkable feat of being an IMO gold medalist mm -hmm. and the winner of the 2014 USA Math Olympiad. Uh, and I know there is a, a funny anecdote about that. Uh, could you delve into your unique experience of participating in the in the Olympiad after midnight till 5 a.m. in the morning <laughs> while you were in Taiwan? Well, yeah. So in the last year of uh, high school, I spent a lot of the time in Taiwan and I was uh, competing for the IMO team for Taiwan, actually. So um, I basically uh, ran off from my normal high school and just like abandoned the classes and uh, was taking IMO team selection tests in Taiwan instead at their training camp, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I really liked the students that I met there. We had a good time. Were um, you living in Taiwan or the USA at the time? Um, at the, at the time, my family was living in the USA, but so it's so like only my immediate family is in Taiwan and like the rest of my extended family lives, or sorry, only like my immediate family is in the United States and the rest of my extended family just lives in Taiwan. So I kind of was just like, in Taiwan, the way their selection camps worked is that they would have uh, like, for a while, they're like basically every two weeks, like um, every other weekend, they would have an in-person camp um, in I, I forget the name of the university now, but it was one of the universities in Taiwan. And Taiwan is like small enough that you can actually just go from one end of the country to the other in like a few hours on the light rail. Uh, so um, yeah, they, they, I like flew to Taiwan and like when the camp was happening, I would like be staying at the camp. And then when the camp wasn't happening, I would be like staying with my relatives in Taiwan. Uh, so it, it was kind of like a temporary stay. It was like, I, I did have to fly back to the United States a lot to like, you know, pretend that I was still in high school. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it, it was a lot of flying. Uh, but w where did you have yeah. your high school officially? Uh, officially in the US, yeah. Just It was like a random public school on the in California. Um, but eventually you were able to sit for both selection exams? No, I only did the Taiwan selection exams. Um, back then, so these days there's explicitly um, guidelines that say that you're, it's, um, you're only permitted to attempt the selection exams for at most one country in any given year. Um, but in my last year of high school, I was uh, was not trying to compete for the United States team. Um, so how come, then, so, um, why did you choose Taiwan? 
Well, back then they had, back then the selection process was like this multi-year process and I wasn't invited to the U.S. summer camp in 2013, like the year before. And if that, yeah, back then the way the uh, invitation structure was set up, like if you, um, if you weren't in the summer camp the year before, uh, then you weren't eligible to compete for the, for a spot on the next year's IMO team. Like they picked the IMO team from a subset of like the students that were at the previous year's summer camp. Um, so yeah, the, the short answer is that I wasn't eligible <laughs> for the US team. Uh, so are you saying that you did not make it in the first year? So that's why they did not call you for um, the USA camp? Uh, it's so. If you want to read about this uh, beautiful selection procedure that is uh, so complicated that it's not written on the website anymore for the MAA, uh, you can check the FAQ on my website. And my best understanding of what the current system it is written there, it's, it's like, it's it, it's so complicated that the the public relations team at like the, the, that runs the American contest just like doesn't publish it because it's such a mess. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was yeah, it was because like yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't make the team in junior year or qualify for the summer camp, so I wasn't eligible in senior year is the very short version. Cool. Uh, I, I went yeah. there because it's so, it's so inspiring if you could not mm -hmm. uh, manage to qualify for the USA team mm -hmm. and then you get gold at the IMO. So mm -hmm. that's a very nice story. Um, yeah, no. I think it's true that in the United States, there's uh, there's a, there's there's probably more than six people in the United States that could get a gold at the IMO every year. So I don't think it's like super surprising either. Um, yeah, that's a pretty interesting sorry. question. How much do you think um, uh, are there gold medalists at, at the USA that like students who are eligible to to win gold mm -hmm. at the IMO? I think it's quite. A few. I think the general sentiment in the United States is that like, um, um, it's kind of like the there, there's a sports cliche of like on any given day, which is like pretty true. Where when you look at the selection scores of like on on the team selection test, when you look at like the some of the scores of like the top like, um, say like twelve contestants to the top top six, like it's not like twelfth place is like a lot behind like top six, like. Um, you know, usually anywhere from like fourth to like twelfth place are all like within the same ballpark. So I think it's like not the case. I, I think it's like even if we had, even if like the United States sent like two teams instead of one for some reason, I think like the second team would also of seventh through twelfth place would also do pretty well. Um, cool. Now I uh, have interviewed the deputy leader of China in IMO twenty, the, the last one, twenty twenty three. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've shared the interview on Instagram and asked him the same question. How many Chinese do you think are eligible? Oh, yeah, that, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said 20. I expected more. Oh, oh yeah, I would expect more than 20, actually. <laughs> he was humble. So um, today you're, you're a coach of the USA uh, team, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I am one of the coaches. I'm not like the head coach. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, how, how has your personal journey as an IMO participant influenced your coaching methodology? Um, I use a lot of the problems that I saw on exams when I was a student as training problems. <laughs> uh, yeah, like the, the problems that there, there are certain problems um, that I did as contestant, uh, like I'll even throw out some names here for the people that know what these names are. Like IMO shortlist 2013 A4, um, there is a, I forget the exact number. There's a Taiwan quiz problem about um, xi minus one plus xi plus one over xi. Um, those of you who have taken my classes will know which problem I'm talking about. Uh, but there's certain problems that left a very deep impression on me, like when I was a student for whatever reason. Like I think I learned something from them, or like the problem like was really special to me in some way. And all those problems make it into my training materials uh, because I like am very deeply invested in those particular problems. <laughs> Well, coaching the United States math Olympic mm -hmm. team must come with uh, with its set of highs mm -hmm. and lows. Could you share some mm -hmm. of the challenges and triumphs you've encountered? Oh, it's actually not as challenging as people think. I think the students are just really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it is. It is true that like um, I think when I first started like coaching, not not even just the US team, just in general, I was like kind of super invested in like my kids' results. Um, where you know it, it was kind of like a sports coach thing, where it's just like yeah, you you really want this to you you really care about like 
how like the the final score that the students get and then like kind of like after like three or four years i was just kind of like you know what like as long as the student has like a good time like through the training process like they think they got something out of it um, not even like necessarily out of the score just, they felt like they improved mathematically they did some they did some work that they're proud of etc etc yeah then that's good enough i don't I'm I'm at a point where I like am no longer super invested in like the individual medals or whatever that the students get. Uh, and that's part of the reason I made a deliberate decision a few years ago to like stop. Because uh, when I first started teaching, I did the thing that everyone does, where they um, write you know, write down the list of awards that their students have won. And you know, at, like about three or four years in, I was just like, you know, actually this isn't that important to me anymore. It's just like as long as they have a good time during the training process, that's good enough. Um, so, um, if you are teaching mm -hmm. a class for the first time, mm -hmm. are there any criteria uh, you're looking for in students? How would you know that someone is getting somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, is this for like selecting the students or just like during the... It's like your personal feeling because the selection will eventually happen through, through a test. But you do have like a... A personal instinct telling you, ah, oh, this guy is he he's gonna win gold in the IMO. Mm, I don't think my instincts on on this are actually particularly good. Uh, like when I first started, um, like when I when I first started teaching, I used to have impressions like this, and um, they were often wrong. <laughs> it's the short version, uh, and. Yeah, I don't know. I, I sort of think like the contest is sort of like a sports game in a lot of ways. Like you know, you don't. Uh, we upsets just happen. Is part of the. It's part of the game, and yeah, I think it becomes a lot easier once like I'm not personally invested. It's like oh yeah, the the game will happen, and like whoever does well is whoever does well, and it's fine. Um, I so I don't I don't spend a lot of time like trying to think like predict who's going to win. And I think I wouldn't be particularly good at it even if I tried. So throughout your coaching career, do you have any tips or tricks for effective coaching or something that you learn that you can give some advices to, to other coaches? Oh, uh, that's tough. <laughs> um, what do you think works best when it comes to coaching? Is it like you throw the exercise at the students, you give them a lot of time to think about it, and then you give them the solution? Or is it that you never give them the solution until they figure it out themselves? Oh, no, that, I think that's definitely a mistake. Uh, like, you're you're not going to solve every problem, right, because the problems are actually just that hard. And if you, like, work on a problem and then don't read the solution, I think it's kind of like a waste of uh, this, you know. I think uh, they're uh, not not reading the solution is a waste. I think it's kind of a waste. I, I think like if you've spent a lot of time on the problem, you should because I think like people it's it's at a point now where I don't know, maybe this wasn't true twenty years ago, but uh today like you can't run out of problems even if you tried. Uh like there are there are enough problems that there are enough countries that are producing like um good, interesting problems that you can kind of spend your whole life like trying to solve as many of them as you can and you still will not come close to finishing. So I don't know. I feel like if you, when you like come to a problem you can't solve after like, you know, if you've, you've tried the problem for like many hours and like you're not making progress anymore and you're not getting anything out of it. Um, I don't know. Why would you not read this? <laughs> like, How much time do you think a student should spend on a problem to know, it, uh, to know that it's his level? Like, should I uh, find a solution after one hour to know that this is my level and they should be looking to similar problems? Uh, I think it's usually best to measure this as a function of when you feel like you're not making progress is the advice I give people. So I think like the, the naive thing that people try to do is they try to try, try a set, set a total on the, like, the absolute amount of time they spend on a problem. Like it's like, okay, I'm going to spend like a total of like uh, so-and-so amount of time and then after that I'll... I can let it go. Uh, but I think it works a lot better if you uh, do it based on like when you feel like you're no longer making progress, which is a skill you have to learn. Like it is it is actually a skill you learn over time. Like what does it feel like when I'm making progress on the problem? And when it, what does it feel like when I'm just like stuck and you know not getting further? Uh, and usually like the 
the, the sort of like number that we throw out when people want a number is like it's fine to give up after feet, like well for for beginners you can increase this time later as you go on but like for an hour of making if like an hour of making no progress is like a reasonable benchmark to say okay that's probably like good enough um when you're starting out anyways for like for harder problems you might have to increase that number a little um but i think it's like the, the point i'm trying to make is that you can like spend like a couple hours on a problem and like just be stuck the entire time and get any nothing out of it and you can spend like a really long time on a problem and get something out of it the whole time because well, during the process you keep coming up with new ideas or um seeing why your ideas don't work is also a form of progress like you say like okay i you know i tried this thing and then um it doesn't work because of so-and-so obstruction or it doesn't work because it's like just not compatible with the problem in this way and you still learn from stuff like that and you know back in high school there were times when i would um you know, work on a certain problem for like, you know, seven or eight hours. And sometimes I would eventually get it. And like, sometimes I wouldn't like, so wouldn't solve it, but um, would still get something out of the process either way. Um, so honestly, like if you stop when the problem stops being fun, that's probably a pretty good approximation because it's not fun to not make progress. You can, you can tell. Um, well, one of the mistakes I see a lot of students doing is that they would uh, stick to one idea and mm -hmm. just keep banking their heads uh, to the wall with just one idea the whole time. But I tell them, if an idea does not make any progress in, in around 10, 10 minutes, you should change it. Do you agree with that? Uh, it depends on how good you are at telling whether your idea is making progress. It can vary a lot. I do think, I, I do see the thing where people are stick to an idea too much. Um, I think, it is hard. I think prioritizing approaches is just one of the things that makes Olympiad hard. So there will not be any good general answer I can give that will catch all and you will have to do it, you know, on a problem by problem basis based on your experience. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't put a number on it. I, I feel like uh, I'm more scared that if I gave a number, th this is something that I found over the years. It's just that people take, people kind of take me too seriously. Um, so I worry that if I like put a specific number on it, like if I say like, you should switch ideas after 15 minutes, people will actually start taking a timer and like you know, measuring to 15 minutes and then switch <laughs> kind of thing. Oh, uh, I was like, no, you, you actually just need to, um, like you, you, you need to get the, ex you need to get experience so that you have good instincts and then you should trust those instincts that will work better than like trying to go off like a recipe that someone else tells you. Do you have any advices yeah. for students preparing for math? Um, yes, the, there's a lot of it. <laughs> uh, so do, do. Let's, let's stratify this by level, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, okay. Well, so first of all, for the people that are back watching this recording, um, if you go on my website under the frequently asked questions, you'll find more advice than you can possibly use. Uh, so you know, if you want the full answer, that's there. Um, I would say for the beginners, I think the most important thing is that uh, there's a saying in Go that I really like, which is that you should lose your first 50 games as quickly as possible, which is that when you're first studying Math Olympiads, I think the first thing you want to do is just like, you want to get like a lot of exposure so you have a sense of like what the world around you looks like. And um, it is, I would say it is generally a mistake to try to um, over plan your studying. It's just like, when you're starting, you don't have any instincts and you would like to develop like any form of instincts as quickly as possible. If you want like you know, specific, like, you know, what's good to start with, uh, if you look at my website, there's lists. It's like, you know, these are reasonable things to start. Um, but in general, I think like you can't go too far wrong with any of the things you start with. But yeah, I, yeah. Any, any particular advice that stands out? Um, lose your first 50 games as quickly as possible. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing. Uh, on, your, on your website, do you have such a thing as devices for coaches? Yeah, if it's not on the static website, there will be some stuff on the blogs. Um, but the, the first time you teach it will you probably take forever. Like I think the first time I planned like a two or three hour lecture, it took like seven or eight hours of my time. And you get faster over time. But like the, the startup costs for this are um, quite high. Um, I think I don't want to be too prescriptive because I, I, I think teaching is one of the things that is like pretty personal and eventually like you just have to like adopt your own teaching style rather than, uh, 
finally follow someone else's advice. I will say that in general, um, one of I, I will tell you like how my style has changed over the years, which may or may not be a useful barometer for like things that might surprise you. Um, I mean, one of the things is like over time, I would kind of give my students more and more autonomy. Um, like an example of this is when I first started out, like you know, the problem sets were like. Uh, well, like problem sets I gave my students were just like an ordered list of problems numbered one through n, and the students are kind of expected to solve all of them. And you know, I would have to worry about like, okay, you know, yeah, do I want to put like this super hard eighth problem on that you know, is going to teach them a lot if they solve it, but it might also take a lot of time, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, have you feel like I have to like make all these um, decisions for the students? And if you look at the way Otis is structured now, um, the problem sets are like. Uh, they're, they're like a they're they're a set of like a lot of problems like on the order of like twenty problems and then each of the problems has like a number next to it which is like some number of points and then I just tell a student like yeah solve whichever subset of these like gives you like a certain total and like um, if you don't know which ones to pick just like, pick whichever ones look more fun <laughs> uh, it's kind of a thing where, like you you know. Before I was like, I'm going to prescribe like exactly the set of problems that I'm going to ask my students to work on, and now I'm just like, yeah, you know, here, here's like twenty of them. Like, pick whichever ten of them look most fun. Yeah, and I think that's sort of this general thing, which is it's. I think it's more fun for the students, and it doesn't really change much because the students are generally like really self motivated, anyways. And if you give them autonomy, they will typically use it well. Is the thing that I've. That's one of the things that I've I've changed over time, um, with the style of coaching that I do. Um, it's the same for like picking like what things they want to work on. Um, like in Otis, the way it's structured is that there's a bunch of units on different topics, and I don't prescribe in order of the topics. I just say, here's a catalog of all the topics. Here are, like some like vague recommendations that I pulled out of a hat if you want some, but also just pick whatever you want. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. That is something that people have told me they enjoyed a lot, which is that they feel like they have the uh, freedom to work on what they want to work on. Um, instead of having someone pick for them like a lot of other places because you know ultimately they they actually know this themselves better than I do. Like they're they're smart kids, you know, they know what they want to work on. I don't need to make all the choices for them. I I love that. That's mm -hmm. so true. So that the relationship the uh, the relationship between the coach and the student is not a top down relationship where there is mm -hmm. a hierarchy and you're mm -hmm. composing yeah. something on the student. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely true when the student has the freedom to choose it does not feel like a chore anymore it feels like mm -hmm. he's he wants to do that yeah um do you have a favorite memory or moment related to the olympiads that you'd like to share like what is your best <laughs> moment uh related to the olympiads <laughs> Uh, I have to think a lot, bit about best. I will give you like one of the best, um, and then might end up thinking of something of later, um, which is well, this is just like one story, a kind of personal story, um, which is back when I was at the summer camp in 2011. Um, that was the first year they had the a test at the end of the camp, which they still do, which is called the TST selection test, which is um, one name that you can call your exam. <laughs> People couldn't stop making fun of the acronym when it first came out. It was called like the TSTST. Um, and it was sort of like the final exam at the camp where from there they would select a group. The, the top students would get to be eligible for the, um, would compete for spots at the International Math Olympiad the next year. And um, yeah, the first year that I took that exam, I got completely wiped out, by which I mean I didn't solve any problems on the across the 13 and a half hours. So it was the standard four and a half, three. Um, there's three days, so there's a total of nine problems. I didn't get any of them. And um, how, how old are you? How uh, old back are you then, oh, oh, I was in ninth grade at the time, so I just finished my yeah. So I yeah, that was three years before I competed at the IMO. Um, and then three years later, when I was taking the USA Math Olympiad in Taiwan. You know, from 12.30 a.m. to 5 a.m. as is like, you know, that was my last one. Um, that was the test where I solved all the problems. And the very last problem on that test um, turned out to be essentially the same as one of the problems on the 2011 TSTST that I didn't get. And I didn't even know it at the time because like, you know, 
But back in 2011, I, I was so in over my head that I had like no memory of any of the plot. I was just like, wow, that, that test happened and I didn't know anything. Uh, but it was like this kind of really great feeling. It was like, well, the last American problem that I did was one that I didn't manage to solve three years ago. And in fact, it was so over my head that I didn't even remember the problem. Yeah, it was also 5 a.m. So I was like. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. But how did you succeed in the USA selection test and still represent Taiwan? Oh, the last the, the last US exam I took was not a selection test for me. It was just like the National Olympiad. Uh, like I wasn't in the selection process for 2014. Okay, got it. Yeah, it, it, yeah the, the selection process for the US is very technical now. It's It has a very long flow chart of things. Um, so there is the National Olympiads and there is the selection test, which are not correlated. They, they are... The National Olympiad is one of the selection tests if you took the other selection tests. That's the, the short version, which okay. I did not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, your works, notably the Euclidean geometry in mm -hmm. math Olympiads, which I personally use, mm -hmm. um, and the Otis have garnered significant attention. What inspired you to pen these books? So well, so I told you the story of Otis, which is the like someone asked me, and I was like, okay, sure, why not? Uh, the story of the geometry book was that I was I wrote, actually just wrote that book in my last year of high school because I was like trying to write a set of notes for myself. It wasn't it wasn't a, supposed to be a book, okay? It was just like oh, I have all this geometry that I like learned from the summer camp and like from the forums and whatever, and uh, it is taking a lot of headspace, and I would like to have it in writing. Uh, so I started like, you know, putting into notes and I started flashing out the notes and then I was looking at it and was like, actually, uh, maybe I can use these as like lecture notes for my school's math club or something, like at least the first few chapters. So then I started flashing it out more and I was like, oh, actually, you know, maybe I'll just flesh out this chapter too a little bit. And eventually I was like, oh, um, because the thing is when I was a senior in high school, um, I wasn't taking a lot of high school classes, uh, by which I mean I had like two hours of like normal classes in the morning and that was it. And the rest of the time I was like, I think my official, um, the official class name was like office assistant. So I was the person that kind of sat in the front office in the school. And then every like 25 minutes, a parent would come in and I would stand up and say, hi, how can I help you? And then, you know, direct them to the correct part of the office. Um, and it was, so I was just kind of sitting there in the office and I was like, well, I'll just work on my geometry notes. Uh, because, you know, the parents only show up about once every 25 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, when you do this for three hours a day, five days a week, uh, it turns out you can get a lot written. <laughs> so eventually I had these notes that were like a few hundred pages long, and I was like, well, you know, I'm using the first few chapters for my school's math club, but maybe I can do something else with the rest. And I contacted like a couple of professors I knew saying like, hey, I wrote this thing, like, what do you think I should do with it? And one of them was like, oh, this is actually pretty good. I think you should try to get it published. And so they sent it to a publisher and in a very slow process over two years, um, it got edited and then it got published in like 2016. So that's how that happened. It was also not my idea. It was someone else's idea. It's like, oh, you know, you wrote this thing and it's actually pretty nice. You should try to make it into a book. And then they had to rewrite a lot of it <laughs> because that's what happens when you try to publish something. <laughs> I have selected some codes from your website, uh -huh. which are, I mean, you have some very interesting codes down there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the codes that attracted, got my attention is nobody should start to undertake a large project you start yeah, with a small trivial project and you should never expect it to get large uh, yeah in code i think this code transfers to problem solving in a way that one should always try to simplify the problem solve an easier version and then he might build build his way back to the or up to the original question wouldn't that be the most fundamental pillar in, in tackling problem solving Oh, uh, I, I think examining small special cases is definitely good. I think it's an underrated skill. Um, I also think sometimes you can kill the problem outright and developing an instinct for what you should, when you should do so is a good thing. Um, but I think one of the things I said is, um, one of the ways I turn this into actual advice for my students is that like, 
very broadly, like when you are trying to solve a problem, like you can try things that you think will like end up in your solution. Like you, you try a particular method or you try like a particular estimate or so on. And you can try a second kind of thing, which is like the things that don't end up in your solution, like in this thing that you actually write up, which is along the lines of what you said, you know, if you try um, smaller cases or special cases or like simpler versions of the problem, you know, you might, doing this might, will give you some good heuristics or they might give you some ideas or something and they don't end up in your solution. That is actually an important thing to realize, which is that, you know, on the competition, you saw, you know, if you solve the small case and it gives you an idea and then you use that to solve the general case, uh, the small case does not end up in the thing you submit and it will not end up in the official solutions file. And that is something that is hidden from um, people when they are studying. So I think one of the things that I learned for intermediate and advanced students is this idea that like, um, you know, you can kind of split things that you try into things that are formalizable and end up in your work and things that are um, help you understand the problem better, but may not necessarily um, actually be written down in whatever you submit. Yeah, I think the the actionable pieces of advice for students are like, um, if you are feeling stuck on a problem, then that is a good time to try try more of the latter kind of thing, like the the thing that doesn't end up your solution that helps you understand the problem better. Um, I really need better names for these. I think I have like one blog post when I call them like hard or soft, uh, but I don't think that name ever really caught on. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think the actionable advice is you you try the soft things when you are feeling stuck. I think when people like if you if you see a problem and you have an idea of something that might work, I don't I think even if I try to tell the students to like not try it first, they would still try it anyways. So you know it's kind of a moot point. But I think it's fine to try it first too. Um Yeah, in, in general it's just I think with strong so, so, students. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. I'm I'm not sure I'm following here. Uh students might try what? Uh, okay, let, let me just use the names. So I'm going to use hard techniques to refer to the things that end up in your solution that are formalizable. So like specific um, techniques or estimates or and so on and so on. And I'm going to use soft things to refer to the things that do not end up in your solution, like but help you understand the problem better, like trying special cases, trying smaller cases, simplifying the problem, deleting hypotheses, um, asking why certain conditions are necessary, finding equality cases, finding counterexamples to um, more hopeful conjectures that you think might be true, et cetera. So hard stuff refers to all the stuff that actually does the work of solving the problem. And soft stuff refers to all the stuff that is not formalizable, but helps you understand the problem better. The advice I have is that when you are feeling stuck is a good time to try more soft things, is the short version. Um, I think when people have ideas for hard techniques they want to try, um, when they see a problem, um, I think it's fine to try them. And even if I try to tell people to not, uh, oh, what happened to me? Oh, there we go. Even though I told, told people to not try them, they would try them anyways. So like, whatever. <laughs> but in general, I think uh, there it, it is a kind of thing you have to balance too. Um, and I, I, I do agree with you that people have a tendency to not try the soft stuff enough. So it, in so much as there's a spectrum, most people should be shifting more towards using more soft things. Um, but also, um, but also, eventually, what you want to do is just develop instincts on which things you should be trying to do on a problem by problem basis. And this is something I will say a lot, which is that it is really hard to give good general advice. And like the, in so much as you want to give advice that applies usefully to everyone, that useful advice is usually develop your own instincts and decide for yourself. Don't like let someone else decide for you. Um, uh, and another quote that uh, got my mm -hmm. attention is. It's hard to do a really good job on anything you don't think about in the shower. Can you elaborate on that? I think the results of forcing yourself to work are very noticeably inferior. I don't think very many people do well on anything if they have to force themselves to work. For forcing like a little course, because that's kind of like, there, there, there is a bit of a spectrum to it. But I think in general, you will usually not do a super good thing at like the, well, what's the word for it? it the quote comes from a Paul Graham essay about, um, what's called like the top idea in your head, which is like what you naturally think about if you don't, aren't thinking about anything else. And that's why like the thing about like what you think about in the shower is sort of like a way to like tell you like, you know, it's it's whatever that thing is. Like, you know, if you, whatever you're thinking about when you're not thinking about something else, like this top idea in your head um, kind of gets all your attention and is passively being worked on even if you're not trying to. Whatever is not the top idea in your head will get starved of a lot of um, bandwidth and yeah, I think that's just a general quote about like 
the a pattern of like um, how you become really good at something. People talk a lot about talent and hard work, and I think what people should talk about more, and this is also from Paul Graham, is that they should be talking about like interest because interest is more unevenly distributed than talent. It's a good, it's a decent proxy for talent in the sense that you will probably be more interested in the things you're talented in, and also it's a substitute for like. Um, work ethic because if you're interested in something you won't have to force yourself to work on it interest is a substitute of work ethic so i believe that there are two two ways of thinking there is the active way of thinking in which you sit down and you're drawing drafts and trying some mm -hmm. tricks and strategies and there is the passive one the one you just mentioned here is that mm -hmm. when you're walking or you're in the shower and your mind is working passively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much do you think we should balance these two ways of thinking? Uh, the way I think about it is that you can mm -hmm. uh, take uh, a problem and think about mm -hmm. it actively for, for some time. And once you get bored, it's okay to just let it relax, go do something else. Oh. And meanwhile, your subconscious is doing the work. Oh, yes. Okay. Answer. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. It is, um, yeah. If you're bored, don't force yourself to work. <laughs> I think it's this yeah. version. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not help anyway. Yeah. Um, One way I used to apply this when I when I take any exam, whether in high school or mm -hmm. university or for math, is that mm -hmm. I would read the full exam at first and oh. then uh, start tackling some the questions that 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 are the most obvious to me. And that way, those ones that I'm not actively tackling are just uh, running in my head, in the back of my head. Yes. Uh, this is something I also tell my students. Actually, I tell my students an even stronger form of this, which is that when they have a three problem exam, I tell them start by thinking about like the last like problem three for like, I'll, I'll make up a number, like 20 minutes, and then think about problem two for 20 minutes, and then do whatever you want. Um, and part of the reason is for the thing you said. So it's like you can have like the hard problems in the back of your mind where you will need that extra time because like the easy problem will, you know, you'll just. In an ideal world, you will just solve it. We do not live in an ideal world, but um, that's sort of the philosophy. And also because people are, I used to tell people the thing you said, which is like, you know, you should try all the problems. And uh, they would say, yes, okay. And then ignore the advice because they were too invested in trying to solve problem two, which turned out to be way harder than they needed to be. And were too scared of problem three because the problem number was three. Um, so at some point I gave up asking nicely and now I just tell people the thing I just said, which is that I actually force them to like, you should actually just force yourself to work on the last problem for um, more than zero amount of time so that you can have the known back of your hide and also that you've actually looked at it uh, because- Does this apply to our levels of students? I think so. I think so. Um, uh, I think, even pragmatically is because um, in the world of math contests, um, it's really hard to predict difficulty of problems. We get it wrong all the time. Um, I could tell you stories about this for days on end. Uh, and also that you get difficulty wrong even in aggregate, like even in aggregate, like what I mean by this is like, you'll, you'll have situations where like um, problem four just has a lower average solve rate than problem six. This, this does happen. <laughs> This happens, so you should take like reasonable precautions so that if the difficulty is wrong, this is not out of order for everyone, then you are not one of the people who, um, you know, does badly on the test and then blames it on the exam design. <laughs> but also because difficulty, difficulty in aggregate is already hard and then difficulty per person is impossible. Like even in tests where like for an average person, the difficulty was in the right order, um, there will be individual people for which the third problem is easier anyways because it's like the problem in the subject they like or it's like a problem in the style that they like or it turns out to be a problem that's similar to one they've seen before you know this can happen too um and you know we, we have a name for this sometimes which is called if you manage to get like a 007 we call this a james bond um and it, it just happens you know this can happen and you don't want to be the person that gets 000 instead of 007 because you didn't look at the last problem so yeah, that, that is a, that is actual thing that I told my students now, which is that you are actually required to look at all three problems, and if you won't do it um, naturally, force yourself to do it at the start. Um, 
that makes a lot of sense. You actually made mm-hmm. me think about uh, this Chinese guy who got zero at P1, but he still managed to solve the hard ones and yeah. he ended up getting the gold medal. Yeah, it, it just happens all the time. I, it, it happens more often than people think, and I don't know. <laughs> Reality has other plans, you know? Just don't plan ahead too much. Okay, I will I'll get a little more uh, personal for the next question. Mm-hmm. What has been the most memorable moment in your life? Yeah, I, I, I'll probably again have to settle for like one of the most because if I try to rank everything in my head right now, I will come up with an answer that I disagree with a few hours later. Uh, but definitely like uh, some of the, the like most memorable things I have are like the things that people, um, the things that my past students tell me about like what, like the impact that I've had on them. Um, I don't know how much I can super share for privacy reasons, but I will just I will just say say in general that I'm a person who like really appreciates the thinkiness that I get. Um, yeah, I try to think if there's like any like individual one that I can share and not have privacy issues, but I can't think of one off my head that satisfies both those properties. Um, so, is it related to students expressing gratitude and appreciation and the impact you had on them? Yeah, yeah, is is that is a very short version. Yeah. Do you have students coming back to you telling that they managed mm-hmm. to do this and this thanks to your work and the effort you're putting on on your blog, etc.? Um, I mean, yeah, that, yes, that happens quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think as like as I said, over time, I sort of like become more agnostic to like the you know the actual final results of the exam, and it's just kind of like you know, as long as they feel like they it is actually one of the things in the that I write in the in the syllabus. There's an appendix that says mission statement, which I don't expect people to read, but it's there just for anyone that does want to read it. And yeah, one of the things that I find really valuable is like when someone can say like, you know, hey, even though I, you know, didn't end up getting like the medal that I was hoping for and so on, you know, I still really appreciated the process that um, of what I've learned to get like get to this point, and I like. Um, I'm glad I did it, even though the final result wasn't the one that I was initially trying to get. Um, and that's something that I appreciate a lot when people tell that to me. Do, do you do one, one-to-one tutoring? Or is uh, people- not anymore. I used to, and then, um, well, the program got a lot bigger, so it wasn't possible to do it even if I wanted to, unless I like randomly picked a subset. But I also wasn't super convinced that, I don't know, I'm just not like a lecturer's person. <laughs> Uh, I, I I might be selling myself short because people told me they were helpful, but I personally was kind of just like, I don't, you know, if I meet the student for like an hour a week, right? Like how much can you do in that one hour? Like one problem, maybe question mark kind of thing, right? Like I feel like, I think the thing it was useful for was like when people had like specific questions about things or like, you know, they had tried a problem and wanted to get unstuck on it. Uh, then it was good because then you could like, you know, talk specifically to that thing synchronously, like face, quote unquote, face to face, even though it was online. Um, and that was good, but it didn't, it didn't usually fill up an hour every week. And also, um, it, these days, like the program that I run has a Discord server where, so all the students are just in this like real time messaging thing. And you can just get like, I won't call it quite face to face because it's not my voice. They're typing like text, but you can get like basically instant responses now, anyways, by talking to the other students because there are like a few hundred of them and one of me. So the response times are actually faster now. <laughs> you don't have to wait until like that one hour meeting a week. You can just like, when as soon as you have a question, you type it in the Discord and within like five minutes, someone else will reply to you if it's daylight hours in the United States. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I never thought it was super helpful, but people kept telling me it was helpful, and then I stopped doing it anyways because I was just kind of like, because yeah. it was kind of disruptive to my personal life too, because you had to keep scheduling like blocks out of every evening to like have a fixed time meeting. Um, so that's how that happened. Yeah, that's so 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 legit. I mean, um, knowing that you are at MIT today, how did you manage to balance all of that? Um. I it's... had I had a friend at MIT who was telling me that if if he can get two hours of sleep per night, that'll be great. 
<laughs> he, he, he does not do any other extra activities other than his studies. Uh, How would you manage the undergrad? Uh, okay, so time management. Um, so I should first make the disclaimer that I spend way less time on my MIT stuff than I should be doing. Uh, the, it, it's not great. Uh, but I will say that one thing, especially for undergrads, is that um, one thing I found out really quickly when I got to college is that you can pick which classes you take. It's not like high school where everyone has to take almost essentially the same uniform thing. And what that means is that you have a lot of control over how much time you are spending. So I'll be concrete about this. Uh, when I was an undergrad, um, the, the way I started every semester is I would sign up for like anywhere from eight to 12 classes and I would figure out which four would take reasonable amounts of time, which for me, reasonable is a very high bar and drop the other N minus four. So you kind of, I kind of did this thing where I like, you know, I would, I would take this, this sample of like 12 classes and I would take the, I would usually end up taking the four that I thought would like be like the most reasonable time commitment. And you can just do this and you will find that you don't spend as much time on class, your classwork as most other people. Um, I think, I think a lot of people felt like, from from what I saw, a lot of people felt a lot of pressure to like take classes that would, um, you know, be very intensive, take a lot of time, really push them, which is fine if that's what you want to do, you can do it. And I think I just decided that it's actually not what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to. I think for me, the thing about like, um, it was more important to spend time with the people that I felt close to, like you know, close friends, because I felt like that was the only time I would be able to like see so many of them at once. And it was important to me that I was like spending time helping a lot of pe other people. So that was like kind of a teaching thing. Um, so I made that choice and that's how I managed to do it. It's just like, I will, um, I don't know. The classes were just not that important to me. <laughs> uh, what are, what are your, your, your priorities today? I think that hasn't changed. I think it's also just like help other people and spend a lot of time with people that I care about. Um, so that, that's maybe the answer to my next question, which is <laughs> what activity or hobby brings you the most joy in life? Oh yeah, yeah it's definitely those two. What kind of activities mm -hmm. do you like doing with with, the, with your friends or your beloved ones? <laughs> um... Like I, there's a thing that I actually tell people, which is that you can tell who my close friends are if I'm willing to travel with them because I actually really hate traveling. Uh, but if it gives me a time, if it gives me a chance to like spend time with like someone I care about, then I'll do it anyway. Um, which is why I definitely booked like plane tickets to Korea for next month. <laughs> uh, I, I I almost just don't care like where I am or what I'm doing as long as I'm with like the people I care about. That's just who I am. Uh, are there, are these people uh, friends or family related? Mm, mostly friends, I would say. A uh, lot of them are actually no. people that I met like in high school when we were doing math contests together. We still are close today. Um, so not all of them. By activities, mm -hmm. by activities I meant, uh, do you do any uh, uh, sports, music, workout, puzzle solving, math maybe? Oh. Oh, hobbies. Um, puzzles are. I, I do a lot of puzzle hunts. So, if, um, no, I, I, I get. I, I realize not everyone knows what puzzle hunt is. So I'll just say very briefly that a puzzle hunt is a type of. It's a type of event where people work on um, a class of puzzle, which is very unhealthily called um, puzzle hunt puzzles. <laughs> so the definition is a little circular, but the characteristics of puzzle hunt puzzles are that make them different from like regular puzzles are usually that um, you are not given instructions on what to do. Figuring out what to do is part of the puzzle, and you are usually the final. The puzzle will have a final answer, which tends to be um, like a alphabetic string of some length. So, so like usually the puzzle will solve to a final word or phrase, and then you the the stated end goal of the puzzle is to find that final word or phrase. It's it's hard. It's very hard to describe if you haven't seen it before. But if you go onto my website under uh, the section that says hobbies, there's a whole page dedicated to them, so you can read about them there if you want. Um, other hobbies, um, yeah, Hanabi is one of them. Hanabi is like a logic card game that you may or may not have heard of. Um, and I actually used to play competitively. Uh, I 
I spent a lot of time playing Hanapi um, around when the pandemic started because there was a very nice website called Hanap.live that let you play the game um, in a way at a, a higher level than you can play with the in-person cards. Like I actually just can't stand playing with the um, physical cards anymore because my memory is my memory is not good enough. Um, the website would track a lot of information for you. Uh, I was, okay, I, I don't know how helpful this is because I'm just like listing off random hobbies that I have. <laughs> but. There is a f famous card game uh, in the IMO community, which is called Tichu. I'm not even sure if the pronunciation is correct. Do, I think you know Tichu it? is the correct pronunciation. I've heard of it a lot, and I've never played it. Um, so I don't know very much about it. But um, the, the only thing I know is that when... <laughs> yeah, I got it. All right, I was going to say, the, the only thing I know about it is that when people say that they don't know how to play teach you, like the people who do know, <laughs> job, you know, make the obvious fun. That's like the only thing I know about the game. <laughs> Seem, seems so live because I learned it back uh -huh. in, in 2013 when I, when I went to the IMO. And last year I went to, to the IMO again. And I mean, this year I went to the IMO again and mm -hmm. it's still there. People are still playing. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I think it survived well. Well, uh, uh, some of uh, my community uh, asked me to ask you some questions. Sure. So um, the question is, many relatively less gifted students encounter a problem where they have learned enough theorems and accumulated enough knowledge to solve a problem, but cannot think of a solution. When they see the solution, they realize they have already learned everything involved in the solution. What do you think is the main reason for this and how to tackle this issue? So there's a couple of various answers I can give. The unhelpful answer is like, this is what's supposed to make Math Olympiads hard. Like, I think when uh, some people who are like not super connected to Math Olympiads have this impression that you need to know a lot of things and you just don't, this, I think this is not true. Um, if anything, I kind of wish Math Olympiads would have a broader syllabus. Um, but yeah, so the unhelpful answer is that like, you know, this is what makes them hard. Like you will not be able to come up with a good general answer to how do I think of the solution. Um, the more helpful answer is to try more solve things. I think that is the main thing I would say, which is that um, you should have this idea that there are soft techniques in your head and you should be trying to, um, you should actively be trying to practice them, I think is the most useful thing I can say, which is that, um, and the reason it's hard is because when you read the solution, they're not written by definition. Like they don't tell you which special cases help them to understand the problem. Um, they don't tell you like, you know, what, uh, sometimes the really good contests do, but I think the majority of written solutions don't explain the soft techniques that were used. And I think the most helpful thing I can say is that you should be aware that this is something that probably happened and you should try as much as you can, it's it's hard because it's not written down. But you should try as much as you can to like kind tr try to think of like wh which kind of soft things would help in like a particular problem, um, which may involve asking people who actually solve the problem because they may not. This again, it's not written down. Um, this is part of the reason that I started doing like the video thing, like the thing on Twitch and YouTube, is because I wanted to actually have on recording like the entire process that went into solving the problem, not just the write up at the end. Um, which kind of works okay, but the videos are also really long. There's a lot of me like just lo like running into walls repeatedly <laughs> before I figure out what's actually going on. Uh, so the 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 signal to noise ratio for the videos is not particularly high, but it might be helpful to watch like a few of them just so you can see that like you know yeah the at least you could be aware that the process does usually involve like uh, going down a lot of dead ends. Usually, depends on the problem. Um, but yeah, the soft technique thing is the main thing I would say, which is that it's not written down anywhere and you just have to start like thinking, try to think about this for yourself. How do you deal with the less gifted student? Like you know his that his IQ is not at the level of to, to be part of the, 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 the IMO team, mm -hmm. but you also see that he's very motivated and he wants to work very hard, but he's not as smart as his colleagues. How would you deal with that? I, I, I had a similar case before where mm -hmm. someone 
is he's, he's not smart, but he's hardworking. But I also know he, he it's very hard for him to make it to the to the Olympia. So so I so I probably should start with the thing I said in, earlier about I think interest is a better proxy than IQ or talent anyway. Uh, like as I said, I used to kind of I I have been wrong before about which students I thought would do really well. Um, so that is one thing that's kind of humble me is like, you know, even if I like feel like, oh, you know, I feel like maybe this student isn't going to like do that well. Um, I don't know. I don't trust that feeling too much anymore anyway. Uh, I think the other thing that helped me a lot was the thing I was saying earlier, which is that I sort of became agnostic to the final results of the competition. And part of the reason is that I just have a lot of students. So like by definition, like it's not actually possible for them to all score within the top end because I have more than N students. Uh, but I, do, I definitely do think it's just like, okay, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like the the whole point of math olympiads for me was that the training process was the thing that was intrinsically valuable not like the fine not the final result that they get out of the training but like the process itself of like working through the problems and thinking about them was supposed to be something which i want the students to both find enjoyable and also find like um useful not just for math but just just very very broadly speaking because it, i think it develops a lot of skills that you can't that you will not develop the like similar skills through a standard K through twelve curriculum in a lot of places in the world. Um, so I don't know. I th so the the very short answer is that I don't do anything differently. I guess if you want, it's, it's just like you know, um, you let the student work on what they want to work on. They take their own time. Some of them will go through it faster than others. It's okay. Some of them will do well on the final exam. Some of them won't do well. Also, that's okay. Um, and actually. If you look at Otis, um, the title that I give myself in Otis now isn't like instructor or coach or director. The The title that's written on the website now is Game Master, is what it's written. Uh, and that's sort of like kind of the attitude that I have is, you know, I'm, you know, the contest is kind of the sport, this game that I'm writing, um, and I'm just running the game. You know, I'm not invested in, the, the Game Master does not take sides. Um, the game master does not root for individual players. They just want the game to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question from the community. Mm -hmm. Geometry is often treated as the subject in which a student may not do well, even if they practice a lot. Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was... of, yeah, yeah. So uh, I continue because of the huge amount of configurations and variations in the problems leading to uh, leading to students often not being able to recognize the correct approach to a problem. What is your advice to students who encounter this problem? Do you think it's effective for students to list out all the possible tools they can use during the competition, like theorems and tricks? I have heard secondhand of people making lists. I have never heard firsthand of anyone who made lists and found them helpful. Um, that certainly doesn't describe me. Uh, yeah, again, like I, I, I don't want to be too prescriptive, but I have never found making a list of techniques to be a helpful thing. Mm -hmm. Just that that is my own experience, no. and I also don't uh, know of anyone who okay. feels that way either. So, do you think it's it's more uh, more interesting to start the problem and get inspired from the problem, other than yeah. having some tools and ideas and trying to impose it on the problem? Yes, that is generally my experience. That that is just why I think it's so hard to give. I, I I'll keep saying this over and over, which is that like, um, it's so hard to give good advice that applies to all problems. Like every, like all the success, all the most successful people that I know kind of have this. Like, you always have to do things problem by problem. Like the pro like. The reason math olympiads are hard is because you cannot just like have a recipe that works for every problem. It's like you have to treat every problem as like in you you have to treat each individual problem like it's a like a different individual person or something like that. Um it's and that's why like developing the instincts is so important. It's just like you you will if you come to a contest with a list of techniques and try to like follow the list, it's just the reason it's not going to work is because if that if it worked, then like that's what everyone would do. And it, it is true that when you're starting out for geometry in particular, there is like a list of things that you do want to you do want to have seen like everything on the list, which is a lot of what I think the why the book has been that I wrote has been so popular is because it's sort of like okay, here's like 
the list of all the standard techniques that you should have seen before. But the I mean, wider book. Uh, the, the geometry the book. book? The, the oh, is it white? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, that the ECMO book, yeah, yeah, the Killian Geo book. I, I, I think that's why. So by the way, it's just like, you know, here is the list of all of the standard techniques so that, you know, you know that they exist and you have like, you know, basic proficiency with them so that you can do like those simple problems with them. But like past that, you just actually have to develop uh, your own instincts. And geometry, I think in particular, is more stylistic than the other subjects. What I mean by this is that, um, you know, I think it's true in all subjects that like when people see, look at a problem, like with the, the quote unquote solution that feels the most natural to them um, will often be different from person to person. Like one person will see the problem and think, okay, you know, this feels like naturally this class of problem and then someone else will have a different feeling for it. Mm -hmm. But I also think my observation has been that in geometry, this happens um, more often and to a larger degree than in other subjects. Um, it's much more likely that when you look at the solutions packet for a geometry problem, there will be like six or seven different. If, if the solutions go like solution one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's probably a geometry problem. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, and so I think for geometry in particular, it's important to develop, I think it's more important to develop like a sort of personal style because um, it's not, there, there are certain classes of problems for which there's like only essentially one way to solve it. And for the geometry problems, that's a lot rarer, I think. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, the advice that I give more pe people is to like try to be more comfortable with different approaches. Um, because I think you get more mileage out of trying to treat all perspectives simultaneously than by trying to fix into one kind of thing. Um, like what I mean by, mean by this is that um, like a, a very common story that I have is that, you know, I'm like test solving a problem and I like reduce it to something. And I'm like, I think in principle, I could solve this with complex numbers if I wanted to, but the calculation looks kind of long. So I'm going to like, you know, try to simplify the problem in so and so way so that the complex numbers calculation becomes shorter. And then in the process of trying to simplify the problem, I end up discovering like the, the coordinate free approach, like synthetic approach anyway. And it's, it's this thing that keeps happening where like, even though like I, even when I'm trying to like use a particular approach, um, I end up using a different approach anyways, just because it's like what naturally came up. And I I strongly have this suspicion that like um, being able to move fluidly between multiple approaches will be better than the union of people each trying like one specific approach. If that makes sense. Gotcha, got it. Yeah. Uh, are you a fan of geometry bashing, uh, complex bashing? <laughs> uh, I don't take sides. I, I think my attitude is usually I will do whatever works on the problem. Um, and I, well, when I teach my students complex numbers, what I tell them is that it is less about computation than most people a priori expect. Um, the way that you set up, like I use complex number, well, like in so much as I do use complex numbers or barycentric coordinates or whatever, um, my solutions will be shorter, like will be less calcul will be less calculation heavy than this approaches mm -hmm. of people who are learning the technique for the first time, almost like universally, um, and not by like a little amount, by like, um. Like I remember when I first started like teaching complex numbers and stuff, um, one of the problems that I was trying to use an example was 2017 G8. I actually remember the coordinates of that problem. And I, you know, the way that I looked at the problem and set it up, it took me like, you know, the calculation execution was like maybe half a page. And then we used the problem at the US training camp and then I had to grade the submissions and like, you know, their submissions were more on like the pages of order of like eight pages of calculation. So, what was happening was like because the students picked their setups worse than I did, like the way that they picked their variables, the way that they reduced the problem, um, they had to do 16 times more calculation than I did because they didn't pick the setup well. And I think that's sort of just how these computational methods work, which is that I think the rep the stereotype that people have is that you turn off your brain and try to like slog out through the calculation. And I think that stereotype is wrong. Um, I think you need to it 
it takes a lot more geometry skill than people expect to pick a setup that you can actually execute in the time limit or in a reasonable amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm actually really bad with the calculation step. So if I can't get it, anything that's like more than a couple of pages, I will probably mess up before I finish. So that that is something that I'm aware of. And it's just like, I won't, I won't even start the calculation unless I'm confident that my setup will finish it within a couple of pages, because that's about where my limit is. Reflecting on your, on your journey, are there any decisions or paths that would uh, that you would re reconsider? Were there insights or realizations that became evident only when looking back? I don't think there's that many. I think the one that comes to mind is that I think I was scared of threes and sixes for a long time as well, which is part of why when I started coaching, I started giving people this advice where I forced them to start with problem three, because otherwise they would never try it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, when I was a teenager, I definitely had this problem, this thing where like I got scared of problems because of the problem number. And now that I'm a coach and that I've seen like all the threes and sixes that should not had no that honestly should not have been threes or sixes or whatever, I kind of want to yell at people like, do not be scared of a problem number. Or tests where like sometimes I would be writing a test and I like I know that problem one and two are about the same difficulty. Like I know that one is hard for one and two is easy for two, and no matter what order I put them in, someone's going to be really sad. And I'm like, well, I, I, I have to put them in some order. Like, I, I can't label them 1.5, 1.5 on the test. I actually have to call one of them problem one and the other problem two. And I've seen this happen a lot. And now I know that this happens a lot. But I don't think I realized that as a student and I took the problem order too, way too seriously. Uh, so that, that's the first thing that comes to mind is of something I wish I'd done differently is just stop being scared of problem numbers. Um, I don't know if there's any th other big ones that come to mind. I think that might be the biggest one. Yeah. When uh, when applying to universities, uh, was that process easy for you? Given that you have you 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 won a gold medal at the IMO, like were you easily accepted in all the universities? Or uh, honestly, I have no idea what happened. So because. I'm, so I got accepted in most places, but I don't know like because of what. Um, I will say at the time I hadn't won the IMO or the ISMO yet. So because I got the like the the year I did really well was my senior year. So by the time those contests happened, the admissions decisions had already happened. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't quote unquote know what got me into schools, and I don't super want to speculate because I think most of the speculation that people have is probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to put this politely. I think people have like I, I think people generally are overconfident about prescribing um what they think is good for college admissions. And so um I kind of don't want to be lumped in with those people. And so I generally avoid speculating as much as I can. Uh so if but, you are if you are accepted <laughs> to to an Ivy League school, you must have done something. So if, oh, I, if, I don't know if, if that's even true. I think there is a lot more random noise than people give it credit for. What was, I mean, the content of your application, the interesting points that would attract someone's attention? I don't, I think I wrote a bunch of math contest awards and then I wrote some essays. I think the essays were probably not particularly good. I, I don't know how to judge them. Um, but like, yeah. It, it's hard for me to speculate because I didn't get any feedback. Like, it's not like when when I was applying for graduate school and for fellowships for like the NSF, those actually do give you feedback. So it's a little more easy for me to say, yeah, these were the good things. I, like when I applied for the the NSF fellowship, um, I forget exactly what the comment said, but you know, that that's a thing where I gave them a CV and I wrote some statements, and then the people who evaluated the application actually did write like, okay, we thought that this was good and this was good. So there, there I have some confidence, but for the undergrad admissions, I actually just have no idea. Um, and honestly, my model for most college admissions now is that just, I just kind of pretend that it's like a dice roll and that seems to approximate it pretty well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I even agree with this statement that if you got into the Ivy League, you must have done something impressive. I think it's just really random and trying to read into it is not a particularly good use of my time. What advices would you give to someone applying at universities? How would one navigate that? Oh, navigate um, I think if I think if you believe that it's extremely random, then what you do is you just apply to a lot of places, and then um, by some form of probability, you will probably get into at least a few of them. Hopefully, 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know to what extent the dice rolls are independent of each other, but I think they're more independent than people think. Is my suspicion. What? What about the grad school? The graduate school. Oh, grad school is completely different. Uh, for grad school, it's very. For grad school, um, okay. Well, first of all, it depends on what kind of grad school you're applying to. So the different fields will have very different um, admissions processes. And for math grad school, um, the advice everyone says is that the three most important parts of your application are your first rec letter, your second rec letter, and your third rec letter. Um, for math grad school, it is basically all about the rec letters. Um, the, you mean the like recommendation letters. Yeah, the letters of recommendation for math PhD programs are like the most important thing. And so um, if you want to have a good application, the strategy is to figure out how to get three really strong letters. That's mm -hmm. basically it. Yeah, they, they don't read your paper. Oh. Yeah, they, they just, and even if they did, it would be prohibitive for them to actually judge how good strong the paper is. Um, because I don't know, people just don't read research papers. At most they read the introduction and they read like the theorems that they want to use in their own work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. for this interview and for these very insightful uh, and wise advices. Is there any last thing do you want to, you want to share with the audience? Good luck, have fun, enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs>